16, and we have 66 out of Kentucky's 120 counties that can't even afford to educate their own children, and yet the Kentucky public sending out hundreds of millions of dollars, and the American public is sending out billions of dollars in tax-free income to the international criminal syndicates in South America and Mexico for a plant my granddaddy used to grow by the thousands of acres, and I'm going to redirect that money out of the hands of these international criminal syndicates, and I'm going to put them into the capital tax coffers of Frankfurt so I can lift the people of Kentucky out of poverty and out of the misery and out of these last places. Right. That are but I'm going to redefine the role of government in policing private behavior in the state of Kentucky. We live in a police state. We live in a police state. You can leave here and go out and get in your car and they can set up a random roadblock in front of you, make you get out of your car, bring a dog up to sniff you, your car, and all its belongings, take blood out of the yard, make you pee in a bottle and stick their hands where the sun don't shine. That's a police state. That's a police state no matter how. I don't know, Jack. It reminds me of another fellow I was telling about running for, for governor. He said, well, I'll be for you or against you, whichever helped you the most. <laughs> <laughs> Any government that tells you that the solution to a present-day problem is doubling the prison population over the next 20 years has its head stuck where it's never going to discover the thousand points of light of George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my opinion, no. These people's idea of future full employment is to make half of us prison guards and the other half prisoners. Uh, this man is uh, is an alien. He's not a conservative. He's an alien. He and Ronald Reagan both. Uh, they are willing to imprison a whole generation of people to keep intact the petrochemical and pharmaceutical monopolies in this country, of which he's well vested in each. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's a vampire. I don't think he's an American. I think he's a vampire willing to suck the life out of all us victims in order to remain right. powerful and in a powerful position. But let me take this opportunity right here. Wherever this gets shown, let me tell you something. I am pleased and honored to be in the presence of one of the most brilliant men in the United States. Uh, this Today, gentleman next Jack to you, I've, Mayer, I've... Is author of Emperor Wears No Clothes, and so much more than just an author. Uh, a researcher and a dedicated and diligent activist, and a man who I know for a fact is responsible for tens of thousands of people in this country being able to come out of the closet and stand up out of the darkness and stand up out of oppression and despair and lives of quiet desperation and be able to point to the source of knowledge and the truth and the point of light that this man right here is personally responsible for putting together. I would not be where I am today were it not for Jack Hare. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people would not be walking tall and with dignity and a sense of pride and a sense that they do no wrong by communicating with Mother Earth through the herb and in other fashions. Mm -hmm. And this man right here is responsible for as much of it as I know of. I'm sure other people deserve credit who have helped him out. But this man right here is one of the most brilliant people in the United States today, and I hope someday that this country and the people in it will reward him appropriately for what he's done for freedom and individuality and civil liberties and Mother Earth in this country. I want to take that opportunity right now. Oh, yeah. Does yeah. that mean? Does that mean yeah. I got free grass for the rest of my life? As you no, know? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> Hey, let me show you something you can take back and we'll give you better photos. This is Mr. Henry Ford in 1941 with Popular Mechanics magazine showing off his car made from hemp. <laughs> oh, is that when the whole car itself was made from hemp? And it says so right there in Popular Mechanics, 1941. Is that nice? One more deal in the car. That's an irritating. Mean, they should have never let us find that one. <laughs> oh man, that is that is that is. Let me tell you right now, this is not the case of a blind hog snuffing out an acre there every once in a while. <laughs> this, this, this is dedication, dedication, and intelligence. You know, I think uh, Edson, Edison said that genius is one percent inspiration and ninety-nine percent perspiration. This man right here has sweat his ass off. Oh, yes, yeah, he certainly has. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, I have a lot of good teachers. Okay, and this man wrote a book that I read that was one of the, really, him, Michael Aldrich, had written some of the greatest work on hemp long before I even really understood hemp. Well, he wrote it in 77. The Kentucky really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Kentucky, I read the Kentucky uh, what was it? Marijuana Peace Bill this day. It was I fucking blew my yeah, mind away. Yeah, yeah. It was I, by I, adding that and that, and, I, and the perspectives. So he is not somebody who's 
needs to come to me to learn about hemp. I learned a lot of my hemp from him. Wow. I was born in a jacket. <laughs> does not make you crazy. They know marijuana does not lead you to crime. They know marijuana does not lead you to harder drugs. But marijuana is a system of control that they can exercise over you because you step out of line from their corporate policies. Now this is the Million Marijuana March. And today there are demonstrations just like this in every major city across the world. I think that the laws against marijuana are the most vivid illustration of where this government has overstepped its bounds in policing private behavior. The petrochemical pharmaceutical military industrial complex has utilized the lawmaking powers of Congress to get through legislation which has criminalized the farmer who's gone into competition with these synthetic manufacturers. Hemp is the number one fiber, the number one fuel, the number one food, and the number one medicine. So the laws against marijuana are the most important step that this government's special interest have put together and put on the people to remove them from the natural cycle of things. Unless people actually get out in the streets and actually demonstrate and actually push the envelope, this First Amendment has no life. I've been at these things when we had uh, 50 people, I've been at them when we had 20,000. And I'm always empowered by seeing one person stand up and try to give life and vibrancy and, and, and existence to the Bill of Rights in this society. We live in a police state, there's no doubt about it. You can leave this demonstration and go get in your car and get out on the road. And they can set up a random roadblock in front of you and make you get out of your car, bring up a dog to sniff you, your car, and all its belongings, take blood out of your arm, make you pee in a bottle, if they think you got something. That is a police state. Yes, yes, sir. I will not live in a police state. Our fathers and our grandfathers did not fight and die on the beaches of Normandy and Iwo Jima so that you would have to pee in a cup to hold a job in America. There is a peaceful solution called the Peace Revolution. Now let's take back America. There's a war and we're in it. I know we can win it. So let's take back America. There was a dream, so believe it, and get ready to receive it. Now let's take back America. And when the war is over and we've won it, let's remember how we've done it so we don't have to do it again. There is a peaceful solution called the Peace Revolution. Now let's take back America. Pardon me, I don't think marijuana was a problem back in 1937. It certainly wasn't a problem. It's certainly not a problem today, and it's all over the place. So I don't know how it could possibly have been a problem in 1937, except for the fact that when they passed that law, for the first time, the federal government took over the right to tell you what seed you could plant in the ground and what you could do with the product of that seed. Then put it like this, some people who don't know me give me a reputation for wanting to legalize drugs. I do not want to do that. I'm in the, the business of trying to license and regulate cannabis as a crop. Uh, tomatoes are legal. Alcohol and tobacco is licensed and regulated. And I seek to license and regulate, take it out of the black market status, just cannabis now. I would take the law enforcement dollar, which we would save off of the current, that we're currently spending on detecting, arresting, prosecuting, and incarcerating people who associate with the cannabis plant, if we change the laws, we'd save all that money. I would go after the hard drugs. I'd go after the synthetic drugs, the crack, the cocaine, the heroin, those kinds of synthetic drugs, man-made drugs, which destroy the spirit and uh, overcome rights of determination and self-choice because they're addictive and destructive to the body. But the most insidious is the prescription medicine scourge. Uh, there are 
pharmaceutical medicines have, and their impact on society have paralyzed entire portions of Kentucky, including vast regions of eastern Kentucky, uh, which have no economy and have no jobs and are the main sources for uh, illicit Oxycontin and Lorset and Lortab. And these pharmaceutical companies uh, are out there spending billions of dollars encouraging as many people as they can to take this poison. And they know that it is addictive and they know there's a huge black market that builds up around people's necessity of continuing to take this addictive medicine once their doctor stops their treatment. So there is a, a, a big black market up there and the, the, the uh, pharmaceutical companies are well aware of it. For less than a penny a tablet, they could create Oxycontin so you can't crush it up and snort it. So they're aware of this, and but they didn't do that, and it's not because they didn't want to save a penny a tablet, but simply because they knew they had a big addiction uh, situation and they were going to sell a hell of a lot more Oxycontin than if everybody was addicted to it. And the question of hip, the question of cannabis, is the most vivid illustration of how this government has overstepped its bounds in policing the private behavior of citizens. When they told us we couldn't plant a hip seed in the ground, they severed us from the natural cycle. That is what they seek to do. I call it the synthetic subversion, where they want to replace all the natural products on earth that used to be grown out of God's earth and God's seed and replace them with synthetic products and knock our farmer out of the agrarian society and the agrarian market and make the ghost towns of our small cities and villages across this country. We need to rediscover a cash crop, yes. one that will allow our farmers to go back to the land, one that will allow our farmers to compete with the petrochemical pipelines. You plant U.S. 7% agricultural land in hemp, you would have to import another drop of oil. We can replace the spills in the Gulf. We can replace the uh, environmental catastrophe that the petroleum pipelines have cast upon Mother Earth and instead let our farmers grow hemp as a fuel crop. In 1991, Willie Nelson and I poured hemp oil into my Mercedes diesel and drove it across Kentucky in my bed for governor. That's why he started his biofuel plant. Listen, folks. You all have been handed a, a, a torch. Jack Hare, bless his soul, passed away. I'm getting old up here. You know, we cannot make carry this ball much longer. You have to become educated. You have to learn the truth. 
you have to reach out there and grab the responsibility of maintaining your freedom. Every generation must rewind its own freedoms. And those very sacrifices, right up to the very last second I've been talking to you, made on your behalf, cannot continue anymore. What really counts is your all's commitment to what sacrifices you're willing to make in the future to maintain your freedom. And it's right there in front of you. I encourage you, I encourage you to learn the law. I encourage you to learn the political process. I encourage you to reach out there and take responsibility of your own freedom, live your life like a warrior. God bless you all. Thanks for having me out here in Seattle. Hey, this is Willie, and you're going to be voting for a governor in your state, Kentucky, pretty quick. So think about Gatewood Galbraith, because he's my friend. I've known him a long time. He and I believe the same way about a whole lot of things, and I think you believe a lot of the same things that he does. So hear him out. Gatewood for governor. Gatewood and I was very impressed by him you know we both loved cannabis and we would smoke out at the normal conferences together for a few years but in 1990 about September he called me and said Willie Nelson wants to meet you so I hung out with Willie and we got him some herb and he would have me roll joints about every 45 minutes he'd say roll another one Paul roll another one Paul and so I did then he invited me to come back to Kentucky in October that this guy, Gatewood Galbraith, was running for governor. So I flew back to uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, had a press conference there with Willie Nelson and Gatewood Galbraith. And then they drove Gatewood's red Mercedes-Benz station wagon, powered entirely on hemp seed oil. They took pressed hemp seed oil, discovered that it can be used as a diesel fuel. They poured it right into the engine. We're able to drive from Lexington about 50 miles to the state capitol in Frankfurt. We stopped at the state capitol. The Kentucky legislators went crazy over Willie Nelson. Then we drove on about another 80 miles on to Louisville, Kentucky. And Willie Nelson did a benefit that night in Louisville, Kentucky. We'd always heard that uh, Rudolph Diesel had manufactured his diesel engine run off seed oil. We really didn't understand, quite grasp that. This was in uh, the early 90s, uh, late 80s. And uh, then a fellow from Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada, came through town driving a little Volkswagen diesel, and he was running it off Burger King oil. And so we had just uh, derived some hemp oil out of hemp seeds. Hemp seeds are 30 to 40 percent oil by weight. You got 100 pounds of hemp seeds you can drive 30 to 40 pounds of pure oil out of it. And so we had some of that and he tested it out in his engine and he said, this is the best seed oil that I've ever driven this car on. And so we had seed oil. When Willie came in to do a benefit concert for me, we poured that hemp oil into my Mercedes diesel and drove it about 110 miles across Kentucky. And it was the first time in, I guess, 50 to 60 years that any vehicle had ever been driven on hemp oil on the United States roads. Uh, but Willie told me later on, uh, 12 years later actually, no, I mean, uh, no, about 10 years later, he says, Gatewood, he says, that afternoon we did that, it, it taught me what it was all about, and that's the reason I started my biofuel company, was from what we learned that afternoon driving your Mercedes across there. And we were also smoking about the biggest hooters that probably rode in Kentucky at the time. And there was a caravan of us. We went from uh, the Hyatt there and, and Rupp Auditorium through Frankfurt, the state capital, yeah. which is about 80 miles, and then altogether 120 miles all the way into Louisville, which is the largest uh, city in Kentucky. And then he did a big benefit concert for you there that night. That's right. But, uh, you know, we need we need help in healthcare. Uh, 
hemp as a cash crop out there for the petroleum purposes. Now, hemp, you get 22 barrels of petroleum off an acre of hemp when you grow cannabis in an industrial textile direction. Our farmers need that niche in the energy market, and that would furnish, according to the state calculations, 68,000 new jobs. For seed, hemp is planted in hills like corn, sometimes by hand. Hemp is a dioecious plant. The female flower is inconspicuous, but the male flower is easily spotted. In seed production, after the pollen has been shed, these male plants are cut out. These are the seeds on a female plant. Hemp for fiber is ready to harvest when the pollen is shedding and the leaves are falling. In Kentucky, hemp harvest comes in August. Here, the old standby has been the self-rake reaper, which has been used for a generation or more. Hemp grows so luxuriantly in Kentucky that harvesting is sometimes difficult, which may account for the popularity of the self-rake with its lateral stroke. In Kentucky, hemp is shucked as soon as safe after cutting, to be spread out for retting later in the fall. so heartening to see the the progress that uh, you know of course proposition 215 in california in 96 yes. and what you folks have done here in, in oregon i mean it's just uh uh it's just fuel to, for my fire to see you all actually succeed at something i've been trying to do in kentucky for many you know for 40 years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we need to lift kentucky out of poverty it's one of the most poverty ridden states in the country we find 47th, 48th, 49th, and 50th in all the standard of living indexes. Mm -hmm. Our children are poor, we're broke, we're bankrupt. We can't fund the, the retirement for our teachers or for our public employees. Uh, we need to find and rediscover uh, something that will generate some money in the state. And of course, we were the world's largest producer of cannabis for over 100 years. That's right. And uh, so, you know, I want to go back and, and touch on the history and heritage of the state and get us to return to cannabis as a cash crop. Hey, if we're the first state east in Mississippi to actually license and regulate the hell out of it, uh, we will lift Kentucky out of poverty. I'll fill every hotel room and motel room in that state seven nights we'll out of seven. Make tourism boom, won't it? Hey, it you betcha. Will. These won't be people come in there and drink whiskey and punch holes in your walls. These people come in, sit down, row one, and order room service. The United States Constitution does not provide you the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's in the Independence, Declaration of Independence. That's not law. So you don't officially have a right to that under federal law. But Kentucky has a constitution also, just like all the other states do. But it just so happens that Kentucky's constitution is the most pro-people constitution ever written. That our people back in 1890 got so tired of being raped by the railroad companies that they wrote a constitution that protected the people and kept corporations from being running roughshod over everybody. And even now, that's beginning to fracture as our legislature keeps selling out to, to the, uh, <clears throat> to the uh, folks that I call the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, fascist, elite, son of a bitches. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> what's going to happen is that the very first section of Kentucky's Constitution ensures that its citizens constitutionally are endowed with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the number one section in Kentucky Constitution, so I feel obliged to make it
the number one basis of policy for my relationship of government to the people in the state of Kentucky. I'm going to get it off of their backs. I'm going to take it out of the bedrooms and the bloodstreams and the brains and the bladders and the billfolds and the back pockets and the internet bulletin boards and put them back in the little box where they belong. I'm going to make government not a burden on the people. I think it's the role of government to uplift, enlighten, educate, and endow people with an appreciation of life, appreciation of the social compact, their civil duties, their civil responsibilities, and make sure that we address them as sovereign human beings capable of making their own decisions. And we're going to get medical marijuana in the hands of every sick and dying person in the state of Kentucky. No permit needed. I'm going to take it out of the hands of the 10 and 13 and 14 year olds who are doing it just for kicks. We're going to give them over to the old age homes, to all the old old, old folks in the old age homes. Hey, increase the appetite, put a smile on their face, and think about the increased visitation by the young folks. Hey, let's go see Dad. Okay, folks, here we are standing on the corner of a Man of War and Versailles Road. It's Keeneland time. A lot of traffic. I know it's going to be a large amount of traffic coming through this intersection. I've got a sign here that I'm holding up. You can fix a sign of your own. We'd like you to get a sign from us, but if we can't get you one, make your own sign. Make sure it says Gatewood Governor Independent. You stand on a corner, you get traffic coming one way. When the light changes, you turn around and you get traffic going the other way. And just get as many people as you can to see that image. Gatewood Governor Independent. Oh, I've been out on corners like this for about 25 years. I uh, started, I ran for, ran for a uh, Minister of Agriculture in 83. I started doing it at that time. So it's been, what, 28 years? Step up this way a little bit, Jerry. Let's give you some to the wall. So we don't have to do it. My name is Gateway Galbraith, and I'm an independent candidate for governor. We don't want a political party. My running mate and I, hey, dear, if you're going to use your outside voice, go over and join the other children over on the playground. We're trying to get some serious conversation going on here, okay? So you go over with the other kids over there. You know, people say, Galbraith, you're a perennial candidate. And I said, well, Kentucky's got perennial problems. If the people had beaten me the first time and solved the problems, I wouldn't have had to run again. But they didn't, and they haven't, and they can't. Because neither party can produce a candidate that can disengage from the partisanship long enough to work with the other side to actually get the job done. The leadership of both parties had their horns locked up like two white-tailed buck fighting over territory while our business lays dead in the dust. And. And both of the parties are to blame for what we've got here. Neither party has presented any solutions to it. D and I are not asking you to vote against your party or vote for the other dreaded party. We're asking you to vote for an independent governor who does not care who gets credit for doing what's right for the people. If you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, if you've got a solution to Kentucky's problems, you can come to the governor's office where we stand, and we will do our best, and we will give you all the credit for it. If you come up with a good idea, Mr. Williams had a great idea the other day, and I complimented him on it. And I said, David, I said, when I'm governor and you're president of the Senate, we're going to put that idea through. But, you know, folks, I've got to tell you, Mr. Williams can't win this election. Mr. Williams cannot win this election. I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say. Well, uh, my, listen, if it wasn't for an extremely good mama and the threat of Eddieville Maximum Security Prison, I'd gone wrong a really long time ago. 
So my mom would probably get me on straight and narrow more than anybody else. But uh, when I, uh, as I got older, I became desperate for a role model. And uh, so uh, I looked for the people who I thought stood for the right things. Uh, they're hard to find. Uh, so uh, I decided, and quite frankly, you want to know the truth? I decided to just decide to need the new hero, and there's no reason in the world why I shouldn't be it. Right. Gatewood uh, supported our initiative drive, did so very publicly. He, he'd be very happy to see the turn of events since then. But he was an amazing speaker and one of my mentors. Tell your friends, of course, we don't like it, just hush up about it. Would you? <laughs> Down yet. We watched him run nine races in 29 years, and every time... This is the most efficient vote-getting process in the world. It was classic Gatewood. I do, dear. Good to see you. He ran for Congress back-to-back -back in 2000. Get a photographer. Get a picture of that. <laughs> in 2002, he said he was done after the 2002 election. But there he was the next year, running for attorney general. Literally, I was drafted into this race. Gateway was a soundbite machine. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Get your friends out there. I'll never forget that early May Day I spent with him in 2007 while he was running in the Democratic primary for governor. Thank you, dear. I love you all, too. A street corner charmer. Kentucky's going to be a fun place to live when I'm governor. Who raised Kentucky's conscience. You know, we cannot have that. That's the partisanship that's killing us. Engaging and intelligent, but also right here in my hand, just wacky enough to never be taken seriously by the mainstream. This was the time he was arrested during Lexington's Fourth of July parade. Yes, he was an independent cuss, but Gatewood. Let's head down this way, folks. Kentucky will miss you.